Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. It's going to be a review of a recently published book. It's called Hang In When He Is Not There by Nicholas John Turner, an Australian author. This is published by Splice in the UK, whose mission is to uh, you know, support small independent publishing and uh, first time writers, although I assume not exclusively so. And you'll see that this uh, is an advanced review copy, so uh, full disclosure they sent it to me and I received it about the time of its publication, but have uh, just read it a couple of weeks since it's been out. Um, this is the cover, uh, which obviously I haven't seen. So what is this book? Um, it's already garnered a lot of uh, interesting thoughts, particularly the public and consciousness team did a podcast where they considered it. And it's a book, like many books, uh, without rules. Uh, and like a good portion of those books that were without rules, it doesn't provide a map as to how to navigate this strange territory of literature that doesn't have uh, obvious rules. Um, and I think that forces the reader to concentrate harder. So a book that doesn't uh, have... Uh, have rules is different from something like a fully immersive book like um, A Clockwork Orange or Milkman, the recent Booker winner, which are books uh, of a language, a strange language that the reader has to decode and as they work their way through the book they figure it out, they work out what this language is. Um, but the point about those books is they stay fully self-consistent within it, you know, the language, the vocabulary, the grammar. Once, it, once it's established and the reader uh, comprehends it, it doesn't change in terms of the rules of, the, of that grammar. It's just at the beginning of the novel that it is a grammar and a language without the everyday conventional rules. This is different. This is not about immersive uh, through language. Its language actually uh, is quite simple. It's not a difficult language. In places it's rather beautiful. Uh, some delicious images. I'm just going to give you one of those. Um, so here he's describing, uh, he's in his car, he's gone to visit his mum, but he can't quite bring himself to do it. Uh, she is uh, an obese uh, lady. Um, and she's just come out of the house, and as I say, he's, he's there in his car. If she saw me, she did not show it. From down on the driveway, behind glass, she seemed tidal, gravitational. The scene walked about her centre. Her brow sagged, heavy as milk-laden sponges, and fell in droplets. She soured compulsively, prerequisite to moving from one place to another. Onto the boards as she crossed them. Her hand rose and clung to the breech of the hammock, and she stepped one foot before the other up onto a small coffee table. With a profound shift of energy, she then rolled, shoulder first, into the rainbow sack that swelled like a balloon to receive her, darkened, then started to drip. Before the car crash, my mother was a fragment, bony and stiff. So, you know, that's a, an incredible piece of writing, I think, about this sort of, you know, this person who's very, very large and how she sort of steps up onto a table in order to be able to roll into her hammock and how the fabric receives and enfurls her. A bit like sort of Jonah being eaten by the whale uh, in the Old Testament. So, you know, there is lots of beautiful writing in here, uh, but I think sort of deeper... What this book seems to be about is it's asking questions of what we mean by books, fiction, reader and writer. And I think the author is asking us to consider potential new forms of fiction, uh, which is something I have to agree with, with him about. You know, I think that the, the form of the novel is barely touched. I mean, this book has been described both as a novel and short stories. And the point is... It can be anything the reader makes of it. You know, it can be, it, you know, if you want to call it a novel, it's a novel. If you want to call it short stories, it's short stories. You know, which very much uh, puts me in mind of David Markson's book, This Is Not a Novel, in which the author character in there, in one of his sort of rare insertions into the text, sort of says, you know, this is my Finnegan's Wake. And later on, he calls it something like a, a symphonic, you know, uh, orchestra you know, you could call art, you know, if you're the maker of the art, you could call it whatever you want. And interestingly, uh, there's a little section in here where uh, a reclusive uh, poet who's never published anything, who's never sort of recited it in, in sort of live poetry readings, which he's memorised from heart, you know, by heart. He's not reading from bits of paper. He has a biographer. And, you know, people aren't sure if this is all a hoax or not, if this poet even exists. 
And the biographer says, well, it does exist because I've made him exist. He is the subject of my work. You know, whether he has a material existence or not is, is neither here nor there to her mind. And I think this is what the book keeps coming back to. The notion of book as a material object. One of the characters, you know, uh, buys a new book every day. But he never reads any of these books. All he's doing is he puts them on the shelf and gradually he's reducing the space that he and his wife share. It is book as physical, material object. And yet it is having an impact on the emotional relationship between husband and wife. As against the contents of book, books, the words, you know, there's something sort of diaphanous, like gossamer, like spider silk about fiction. You know, it doesn't exist in the world in that the characters and the situations described never existed because they are fictional. And yet, they must exist on some material uh, level, not just the material level of, you know, being written on, you know, printed in a book. And I think this is what this book is exploring the whole time and asking us as readers to sort of think about the, these issues. So just to read, you know, some things that sort of feed into that. In an, so this is, this is the bit about, the, you know, the poet who may or may not exist and his biographer. In an unquoted poem entitled The Stubborn Mirror, Gould apparently speaks about the experience of reading a series of books continuously for three days, without sleep or food, but all the while ensuring that he forced his eyes focused to move deliberately and carefully onto the edge of each page as he turned it, pausing for seconds and sometimes minutes to pay utmost attention to fine point of near nothingness that separated the words on one side from those on the other, thus defying or else attempting to defy the aforementioned fooling of himself, a sort of Brechtian exercise, as it was described in my own time. His, own, his poetic image, she claims, was that of a spider or else a bug on one's hand, which as one turns one's hand over, must travel over the thumb or the forefinger's edge, and indeed balance there, if the hand so pauses. This poem, she cryptically wrote, was perhaps the most disturbing thing I'd ever read while I was a spider. So I think what's really interesting there is, you know, we are immersed in any text that we read, but the point at which you read the last word on a page, you have to go to a slightly different state because you have to then snap out of that. Your fingers have to focus and your eyes have to focus your fingers on turning over the page. Um, and that's a different sort of mental state just for that brief, you know, flickering moment. And then you're back in the, you know, immersed in the text. But again, it's this relationship of something being material, you know, material product, artefact of a book, which demands that you turn the pages, as against the text on the page, which isn't. You know, on one level, it's, it's sort of solid print, but, you know, it could almost fly away off, off the page. So another example is um, lying in bed on the night of her second interview with Ursula, and oddly possessed by her dependence on an allergy to accurately report on the patient's unusual behaviour. The young nurse likened her own personal experience of reading to the shuffling of a caterpillar, which first drags its back half up, then extends its front to advance. It had something to do with the burden of her mind, her cautiousness and her desperation to comprehend everything around her before moving on. At the end of every page she had ever read, the young woman had glanced over to confirm the page number. Then she checked the number on the next page to ensure that the one correctly followed the other, like a caterpillar, she thought, which cannot move beyond or without itself. I mean, that's an incredible sort of metaphorical uh, explanation or exploration of the process of reading, what it is we do when we read. And yet it's given this sort of material form by this image of the caterpillar who sort of, you know, sort of, as it crawls along, it sort of, you know, shapes its body up into, into a sort of curve, a hump, and that's what propels it forward. And again, it's this difference between reading and making sure you've consumed and uh, imbibed everything on the page. Pause. OK, I've done that. I'm ready to turn, o you know, turn over the next page. And this is in the same story, uh, which a character, uh, this is set in an old age people's home, uh, as a couple of the pieces are. One of the old patients, she, you know, all day and every day, she reads a book, the same book, a Gunter Grass novel. But she's not really reading it in the sense that we read it. You know, she's reading it uh, by sort of scanning the sort of how it's laid out on the page. She's not imbibing 
the meanings of the sentences and the metaphors and stuff. It, it's a sort of aesthetic of it. Um, and that is sort of echoed. Um, and what that brought to mind, what that brought to my mind was the scene in Samuel Beckett's novel Murphy, where two people are playing chess, but they're not playing the same game of chess, or they're not playing the same rules of chess. They, they each have a different purpose in mind. Uh, and again, it's this thing about rules uh, and, you know, make it up as you go along or make it up to fit your own inner aesthetic set, self. So in Murphy, one of the characters is moving the chess pieces, not how they're supposed to move according to the rules, but by the sort of to, to sort of bring uh, a different arrangement, uh, sort of aesthetic arrangement on the board of the pieces in response to the other person's moves. And, you know, that's what this old person is, is kind of doing. She's, she's reading a book aesthetically, not linguistically, uh, not narratively. She's not interested in the narrative. And this chimes with another character who is a, uh, a proofreader. And he is not interested in the content of what he is asked to proofread at all. A lot of what he does is sort of political speeches for politicians. He's not interested in the slightest of the content. He is interested in the aesthetic pleasure of doing his job properly. So there's a, an aesthetic visual uh, harmony almost of the words on the page after he's got to work with them. So again, it's this, you know, this, this theme of the meaning of words versus their physical manifestation uh, in print or in handwriting or whatever. Bearing in mind that as we, you know, the further we go into a digital age, these you know, words on a page, or in this case, words in a screen, are going to be even more like spider silk floating on there, even more diaphanous, even more gossamer. They're going to have no material existence. They're just going to be a set of, you know, binary numbers behind the code that projects them onto onto our monitors and, and stuff. Um, in the future, there will be a completely new brand of cur curiosity. As in, people will want to know things that they've never even thought about until now. They will ask a question that it is not yet even possible to ask. Not today. Even the nature of this question will be completely new. The very nature. All that can be known about the question now is that it is inevitable. Or else that's what I'm all about trying to explain to people. It is inevitable in exactly the same way that it is inevitable for a machine to make errors that do not seem like errors. Errors which make the machine seem intelligent. And there will be no one to blame for this because the question will be anonymous in the purest sense. A meaningless outburst mistaken for language. Which, once the mistake has been made, will seem like a medium by which it has become possible to publicise some entirely personal, yet eternally constitutional, part of the human experience. And here's the thing. There will be no ethical way to ignore the question once it has been asked. If it helps, you can think about this new kind of morality the way an evolutionist thinks about mutations as fortunate accidents, convenient error. Any problems, you know where to find me. So a lot of these sort of things towards the end are written in the form of letters. And I think that's the author again asking the reader, you know, think out of the box, think immensely, think ahead to the future in terms of we may not be reading you know, dead tree books anymore. Books may not be structured as, you know, the novel has been largely structured, you know, since the Victorian times. Um, these are all themes that, I, you know, I'm obsessed with as well, I have to say. And it, it is asking the reader to consider conceiving of different types of novel uh, and about time too, personally, I, I feel. Uh, and the last bit I'm going to read before trying to tie all of this together... Um, Professor Richards gave a lecture the other day on David Gould, who's this poet who may or may not exist. I noticed you weren't there. This too is haunting me. And I'll tell you why. There is one particular phrase in the English language that I find concerning. To write you. In the sense that it is used for the same purpose as to write to you. I keep coming across this phrase lately in books and movies and it always causes me a kind of despair though I believe it's mostly an American usage. To me, the phrase, I'm writing you, can only be a biograph biographical assertion. It means I'm creating you or recreating you through the act of writing. It is similar to a portrait statement, I am painting you, 
That's the only way I could understand it. So here's what I realised last night after watching that Goddard movie and pondering Professor Richard's lecture and thinking of your attitude towards me and then wanting to know why I keep seeing this upsetting phrase wherever I look. Given that writing and reading are the reflection of each other, like throwing and catching, speaking and listening, or for your own purposes, filming and viewing, the phrase, I am reading someone, for example, I am reading Gunter Grass at the moment, must imply a kind of uncreation, anti-creation, or else negation, obliteration, of the subject. In any case, it seems to imply the end of the subject, which in this case is the author, or at least the end of the recreation of the subject, which must be the book itself. So then, it's the end of one of us at least. So I think, again, that's a really interesting, it's the, you know, the, the umbilical relationship of reader and writer. The writer, of course, is absent, you know, unless you have the fortune to go and see them talk in public with, you know, 200 people in the room. Basically, the writer is, is not there, and yet they are there. They have a presence through the words of their book. Um, and there's a clue to, to the process of writing here. So, you know, she's talked about, the, the, you know, this grammatical usage or ill usage, as she sees, of to write you. So she's gone, so here's what I realised last night after watching that Goddard movie and pondering Professor Richard's lecture, where you were absent from, and thinking of your attitude towards me, and then wanting to know why I keep seeing this upsetting phrase wherever I look. So on the one hand, those three linkages of having happened to have viewed a Goddard movie around the same time as attending this lecture where you weren't present and all the personal, you know, stuff... The, you know the reverberations of that and this sort of common thing of keep seeing this phrase to write you and out of those sort of three things that are not associated except in time in proximity she has used it to forge you know the narrative of her story that is how a lot of fiction works we bring together things in association that might not be associated in daily life so you know that is part of you know the art of fiction to some extent is bringing these, these unrelated things into relationships. I mean, that's how symbols work. Um, so just sort of to, to tie all this together, I think it starts off really strongly with three sort of, I mean, let's call them stories, sections, I don't know, of chapters. It starts off, and there's a hint of the, you know, the, the, the nursing home for old people is going to be a recurring theme, which it tends not to be until towards the end where, you know, that the bit I just read about a good to grass novel, well, that refers back to the patient who wanders around with her head in the book all the time. She's reading the same good to grass book, and the cruel trick is played on her by the hospital staff because they buy uh, exactly the same edition uh, in the series of another good to grass book, which is written about the same time, so it looks very similar, and they swap it around, you know, because they keep confiscating this book for her because they think it's, you know, bad for her mental health or illustrative of her mental degeneration. And they swap it out for another book, for another good to grass novel. So, sort of, on the surface level, she's doing exactly the same, because it doesn't matter which book, because she's not reading it, and yet it does matter, because when they insert, almost like a sort of blind control test in science, when they insert another good to grass novel, you know, it, it chimes discord for her, it's not the same book. And if you think about, you know, when we're very young children, you know, we demand to have the same story read over and over every night, and read in exactly the same way. You can't make one change in how you read it aloud to your child. So that's at the beginning of life, and, and she's sort of in her dementia is at the end of life. It's the same process. So you start off with these, these three very powerful sort of sections, I think. And then, and then for me, it did slightly drop off. There was a story about an alcoholic. There was a story about... Uh, um, some sort of sect uh, which had had a very sort of desultory uh, attitude towards sex, both hetero and, and homosexual. They didn't really work for me. Uh, and then we got into an interesting story where a man is talking uh, to this mysterious agent, Vale, uh, about his life uh, and about his wife, uh, who has thrown herself at Vale. Um, and Vale has not responded to, to her... her advances and um, she has therefore demanded her husband call him agent uh, whereas they called him something different before because she sees him as a man with this agent as a man without imagination he doesn't have a poetic soul um, 
that he only writes reports of some sort of spy master or intelligence service. And again, that's another type of writing. Um, but as, as the wife says, you know, it's, it's, it's stuff that we wouldn't be interested in reading because it has no poetry, it has no soul, unlike fiction, which we immerse ourselves in. Uh, and then, as I say, towards the end, they're much shorter, they're almost sort of flash fiction length, and a lot of them are done in the form of letters. And there is some sort of reference back, such as the Gunter Grass, such as, um, you know, being a, a nurse in an old people's home, such as the, the polisher, the proofreader, who went to write a uh, who's gone to uh, write a biography of a famous writer. So they are returned to, but they are not tied up, tidied up with a neat bow on the top. They refer back, there are resonances, but it's not neat and tidy. And I think you as the reader have to decide, you know, how much relevance there is to, to these, these, you know, fleeting returns to stuff that was earlier in the novel. But, you know, I found this a, um, an important book, really, because uh, apart from the fact it shares some of my obsessions as a writer, but even leaving that aside, it will ask every individual reader of this book, how, you know, what does reading mean to them? What does fiction mean to them? What is their relationship to both a book and the absent author? What are the imperatives for authors going ahead from this point to, you know, to produce fiction in a digital age, in an age of information, in an age of jaded palettes where we've read everything? All these sorts of questions. And they are hinted at, you know, in, in very small bite-sized chunks, which again reminds me of the David Markson book, although it's using a very, very different literary function than David Markson, because what Markson used was actual epithets and sayings, you know, that have been passed down through history by, you know, anyone who was anyone in the human race. Um, so he's almost using sort of factoids and biograph biographical details. And this isn't, you know, this is, this is a creative, imaginative narrative. Uh, or, or, or fragments of it, but somehow it has it has the same function to raise these questions by what you know what is a novel? Well, to me this is a novel. To someone else, it's a set of short stories, and both are equally valid. That is the point. Again, uh, as a final thing, you know Samuel Beckett in Murphy, the chess game between two players who are playing entirely different games with entirely different rules with entirely different personal agendas. Um, Definitely worth the read. And, you know, it's 158 pages long. It's not long. And it's not a challenging read in the sense of the language is difficult. It's going to take you a long time to plough through the pages. It's challenging in a different way because you will sit and, um, you know, cogitate and think, you know, what, what, what have I just read? What does it mean? What does it symbolise to me? What does it resonate? Just like the character in here who pauses between moving from the text to the corner of the page to turn over to the next page. It almost forces you to do that mentally, to, to think back and reflect on what you've just, just read. So, you know, I highly recommend this. If you're into this kind of, you know, experimental, for want of a better word, metafictional in some ways, you know, all those sorts of things. Uh, and as I say, you know, it's, it's, it's not a huge commitment of your time, but it may stay with you for a long time after you've finished it and become a commitment as you keep going back and thinking on things. OK, till next time.